mean, you're in, you're in Ireland, right? Mm. So in your county of Waterford, isn't that the most highly vaxxed place in the entire, yeah, uh, in, in the whole country, over 99%, and it has the highest infection rate? Yeah. That is not what I or I think anyone else would have expected, right? And it's like, you're not meant to talk about that, right? You're not meant to talk about Singapore, Israel, Gibraltar, right? These places have extraordinarily high vax rates, and they're having very, very high infection rates. So what is going on there? But it's like, you're not supposed to talk about that. You're supposed to just like hide and keep on repeating safe and effective, safe and effective and safe and effective and not ask or inquire, right? When it comes to adverse reactions in situations like that, again, you're not meant to, you know, it's all these things are supposed to be taboo and people get angry when you even bring them up. And it's like, look guys, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything, but if we can't talk about this and, and point out things that are obviously weird like i was like okay wait that is weird then how are we ever going to really get to the truth Just finishing up, um, putting the final touches on a podcast with uh, Zuby. Um, Zuby is an entrepreneur, rapper, artist, creative, um, podcaster, um, author, and all round um, really sound dude. Um, Zuby came into my sphere. I think a friend recommended a song by him, and then he was kind of on my radar because he's one of these. He's one of these rare individuals on Twitter, on, on social media, who have a, a large following, but who speak in a kind of a totally different way um, than you'll hear on the mainstream media or in mainstream newspapers about COVID. So it's an alternative perspective on it. And I'm always really curious about those perspectives. Um, so I sent um, him an email and he was... Um, decent enough to reply. Um, so in a podcast, we probably talk about COVID a good bit. Um, we do go into his early career and his, uh, his life as, um, as an artist and trying to make it as an artist and, um, you know, being on the street rapping and trying to sell CDs to, um, and doing that over and uh, over maybe 10, 15 years before he was getting breaks here or there. So um, talk about that, his ethos in life and his ethos kind of comes across really in this COVID. Um, anyway, I've said too much, but um, it is it does become COVID related. Um, and uh, uh, but it's 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 a great conversation and I'm grateful to have got the time to chat with him. So enjoy. Where are you now? Right now, I'm actually in Bournemouth, England. Okay, mm -hmm. back home from a kind of a, a tour. Yeah, I've been, gone, I've been gone since July. So I was actually in Mexico for the past three weeks and I just got back here a few days ago. Okay, how's it feel to be back? Um, happy to see my family, but besides that, a bit depressing. Yeah, <laughs> you come back, you've come back at the worst time of year and the worst yeah. time. It's called. I, I don't think feeling a little bit sick right now is uh, disconnected from that. I think the temperature difference and the climate difference has actually made a made a bit of a difference. I think I just begin with where um, you stumbled upon my um, sphere of vision. Well, a friend of mine actually sent on OK Dude song and mm. um, and I kind of looked into, but you were on my periphery simply because uh, um, you were a rare one of those Twitter accounts with a tick and who spoke in a kind of a, not in a kind of a, a in a very clear way, in an authentic way, which seems to be utterly missing. <laughs> in, in actual fact, I would say we're starved of voices um, of any kind of, let's just say there's, you, you may have, you have a presence. Yeah. And with that presence, um, the vast majority at this moment in time are saying absolutely nothing. And so then there's a few voices stand out and 
your one um, definitely is one that's standing out. Uh, and I, I'm just really, uh, um, I suppose, it, first of all, I, I'm grateful. I think anybody around the world who's feeling a certain way is kind of grateful for these voices that, that they kind of go, fuck, right, I'm not, um, I'm not going crazy. I'm not alone. I'm mm. not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not a tin foil hat wearing, whatever. I'm just maybe sort of freedom is one of the one of my anchors in life not even anchors but one of the pillars of how life is lived and um so th i think that's how you came upon my radar um and why do you think wh like i have a view as to why certain individuals from the very start felt something wrong in the pit of their stomach couldn't mm -hmm. explain it but have you why do you sense that is it's a great question I think it's a combination of factors. I think part of it is personality type. I think that that has played a role in every single country all across the world throughout this whole thing. I think basic personality type models have played a very significant role. In terms of things that are more tangible, part of it is certainly that I am as well connected as I am and as many followers and friends and people I'm connected to, I'm not really in the matrix. I've been uh, self-employed full-time for over 10 years now. I'm someone who is, you know, I'm creative. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not someone who tends to go with the flow for the sake of going with the flow or going along with the herd in anything that I do. And I've never really been that way. I've always been a very independent thinker and a critical thinker. I'm not someone who easily gives in to peer pressure. I think it's really important to remember that as, as individualistic as human beings are, we are also very much a type of herd species. You know, we're very much herd animals as well. Anyone who has looked at collective psychology on any level during this or prior to it or all throughout history knows this. People like to conform and most people would rather be in the majority than be correct. I also think that I am far less vulnerable to fear and anxiety than most people. Um, I've actually done personality tests. I'm in the bottom 2% of the entire population on a trait called neuroticism, which is sensitivity to negative emotion, including fear, anger, anxiety, depression, et cetera. So if you put me in a room of 100 people, there's probably only going to be one person there who's kind of more less neurotic than me and sort of more calm and level-headed, especially in the midst of a crisis, real or imaginary. So when other people tend to lose their wits or get very, very emotional or fearful or angry or jacked up, whatever it is, I tend to be the guy who in any situation prior, prior to all of this, I tend to be the person who's like, okay, you know, kind of keeps their emotions in check and just kind of looks at things logically and rationally. And something that really struck me early on and, you know, strikes me every day with throughout this whole situation has been what has been new is the response. So even in my own lifetime, there have been other, there have been other virus outbreaks. There've been other disease outbreaks. We've had swine flu, bird flu, SARS, Zika virus, Ebola, mad cow disease, um, all there have been several others. And I remember the way that the media hyped some of these up and they, they you know, they, they, they really did. Um, but it was never even suggested that we take some of the measures that have been taken. This wasn't suggested in any country, right? During the swine flu outbreak, bird flu, et cetera, it wasn't even suggested that people wear masks, let alone it be mandated. It wasn't even suggested people stay home, let alone it be mandated. It wasn't even, uh, you know, every single year, we, flu's been going my entire lifetime. Flu kills thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people every single year. And it's never even been suggested that people take even one-tenth of these measures in order to stop it. And certainly if people didn't, you would never consider them labeling them, um, you know, anti-vax for not taking the flu shot or suggesting that they're trying to kill people or blaming neighbors or blaming friends, et cetera. So the thing that struck me immediately was the response, both from authorities and also from individuals. I was like, this response is very bizarre. I mean, we're now two, almost two years into the situation. And I'm like, what, what is going on with this response here? It is very clear that their response and the reaction is not remotely proportionate 
to the actual threat that we are dealing with. We're also living in a time where people get offended by me saying that, right? This is the first time there's ever been a virus where people want it to actually be worse than it is because they're trying to confirm this reality. So we knew from very, very early on, uh, having stats and data coming out from all these different countries, one of the first things that came out was, okay, it seems that it doesn't really spread outdoors. So what did they do? They told everyone to stay home, stay indoors. Hmm, that seems strange. It came out pretty early that if you're overweight or obese or vitamin D deficient, you're far more likely to be hospitalized to die. What did they do? Again, they told people to stay at home. They closed down the gyms, didn't tell people to uh, eat well, exercise, perhaps lose some weight, anything like that. So that was another huge red flag for me. Another thing that came out early was, uh, thank God, children are not dying of this, mm. right? This is very, very stratified by age. It's not, it's not a death sentence in any age group in terms of statistics, but okay, if you are over 60, over 70, especially if you have one or more comorbidities, you know, there, there, there is a risk. So it was known very early. I'm talking about perhaps as early as, I mean, I, I think if I, remember, if I remember correctly, by about April or May last year, April, May, 2020, it was well known who was at risk and who was not at risk. It was known by then, okay, kids are not really at risk. Elderly people, uh, especially with comorbidities, are potentially at risk. And, but what they did, and not just in, in virtually every country, was just this very, very authoritarian, one-size-fits-all model. And I also saw from early on that you know, I, I, I look beyond one particular variable. So I'm also considering other aspects of physical health, mental health, people's immune systems, the economy, uh, people's jobs, people's livelihoods, all of this stuff. I thought, look, the, if, if you're going to do this, this so-called lockdown, the longer this goes on, this is going to cause more damage and more death and more destruction and suffering than the virus itself. And also, if you're supposed to live in a free country, then since when has, you know, this, I mean, this whole concept of a lockdown since when, right? Has that ever been, I'm not aware, has that been done anytime in history, perhaps sometime in World War II during the Blitz or something like that? I don't know. But this notion that everyone needs to be, to be forced to do this, it's one thing to give advice or to have recommendations. It's another thing to have mandates and laws and be using the force of the state to force these things. So generally speaking, I think in the midst of a new threat, an overreaction is generally not always, but is generally better than an underreaction. But once you get more information and you get more data, it's very, very silly to not, um, to, to not adjust, right? Mm. Just because you've started responding in a certain way doesn't mean, you know, if, if someone tells you that, oh, you know, you're out in the forest and someone says, oh, there's a, there's a snake next to you, right? It's better to, to, to jump back and take a step away and realize, oh, okay, it's just a, it was just a stick, right? <laughs> like that, that's better. But if you yeah, were to, if check, you were to re- check under the bed to see if there's a bug. Yeah. Man there. Yeah. But if yeah, you realize yeah. it's a stick and then you continue to run another 10 miles, that's, that's not a reasonable response. Mm. So it seems like even up until this point in time, people don't, and again, you know, this, this is not the same everywhere. It's not the same for every individual. This changes a lot based on your location, but there are millions of people who don't want to change course at all, despite all the information all the data, all the facts, all the things that have changed between the beginning of this and now. And mm-hmm. it's like, there are people who are now, they're behaving even more intensely and more irrationally and more aggressively than they were even a year and a half ago, despite the fact that by any reasonable measure, the, the, the threat has, has greatly, greatly decreased, especially with various treatments and uh, prophylactics and therapeutics available. So it's been very strange. It's also been weird, the total singular focus on this one virus. You know, sometimes I talk about this thing and, you know, we can, we can talk about the accuracy of statistics, but even if we're taking statistics at face value, uh, I think the official count, um, of deaths with slash from COVID-19 COVID-19 related deaths across the entire world, almost 8 billion people in the course of 20, what about 22, 23 months. The, it's, it's about 5 million. In that same time frame, you see, people don't, statistics without context are, are, are not much use. And number one is what's the average age? You know, I think uh, the average age is likely over 70. I know in the UK, it's over 80. In many countries. Yeah. Uh, it's know, 82 so, here. It's 82 here. It's 82, yes, which is the same as the average life expectancy in the UK, may mm-hmm. I add. 
Um, so that matters. And then also, in an average year, about 60 million people die worldwide. So in that same time frame, we've probably had between 100 and 120 million people die of other things, many of them at a much younger age. And people don't even know that, let alone care about it, let alone think about it. It's like, there's just this one, there's the one disease now, there's one virus now, there's one vaccination now, it's all focused singularly on this one thing. Mm -hmm. And people have totally forgotten about everything else and all the other threats that exist. And also the threats that come with the response, again, socially, economically, health, um, the impact that it's had on children. I, you're talking to the absolutely converted. I, I could go fucking insane. I know you don't <laughs> swear. I know you're a man for not swearing. I was going, well, am I going to swear today? Well, we'll see what happens. But the um, whole thing ties into sort of this, um, which you talked about. It's interesting. It sounded like you did the Jordan Peterson personality test. You might not have, but... I did, I did. <laughs> yeah, did. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, very good, Jack. Um, but um, I, I actually think, to the very first question I asked you, I think it's kind of linked to the, the, there's definitely something in those people that have had to survive by themselves, let's just say, mm -hmm. who, who've taken risks. And in that taken risk, really, you're left alone. It's just you and whatever risk you're taking and mm -hmm. putting yourself out there. So then you come to rely on your own perspective, whether it's that entrepreneurial and that entrepreneurial energy can be anything it can be creating a business it can be writing a song creating a piece of art it's the same you know it is putting yourself out there let's just say if, if what and it's that vulnerability is kind of i think it changes the mind and then it, it also you, you in that pure vulnerability it is kind of vulnerable putting yourself out there in whatever way it is that you've come to learn to be okay with that you know mm -hmm. what i mean I, I don't know, but that's my sense of it. So, and you've also come to learn as an entrepreneur or creative, or whatever it is, of doing it wrong and kind of go, yeah, okay, I kind of got that wrong. Well, and there's no holding on to that either. I, mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of, um, and so that, because I had COVID back in March mm -hmm. and I had a big, bad viral load of it. Mm. And I was forced to stay indoors. And I actually fought with a couple of people at the time who were saying, look, because all the data at the time suggested, you know, was, 5% mortality, and it was wall-to-wall -wall newspapers back in March 2000, when it started. Okay, so, so, it, so you're talking March 2020? March 2020, oh, okay. so I, there was a, you know, it was really, I was right in the, mm. the thick of it. it, was six weeks, my wife got it, and like, you know, at the time it was, stay in the room, don't hug your kids. Now, mm. that was where I started to go, ah, no, I'm going to hug my kids, I'm not listening. That was the first thing, and then the second thing was, I was kind of going, yeah, but like, I, I want, I, I mean, if I had to get on with it. Yes. Because life, you do just have to get on with it. Mm. Then I would have got on with it. Mm -hmm. but whereas I had to stay indoors, not go out, not go for walks, not go to the shops. You know, I, I could have. That's mm -hmm. the reality of it. You know what I mean? If you're, if, um, so that's where the bell started ringing. But, you know, at, when I was when I was sick and I was sick. Yeah. Um, I, I did I did fight with a few people and they were kind of going, <laughs> Frank, just just look at this a little bit. And then um I kind of, and then I went and apologized three weeks later. I went, yeah, I think it's way over the top all this. Yeah. But we know what we're dealing with now. Let's just get on with it. Yeah. And, yeah. The 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 thing that's important with all that as well is, you know, if we want to talk actually <laughs> if we want to actually be scientific and truthful and logical, is that when it comes to this type of virus, a coronavirus, whether it's a cold, a flu, COVID-19, anything like, is that you can't really, you can't really avoid it, no. right? So you had it in March, 2020. I had it in January, 2021. We're getting to the stage, I mean, two years in, I think maybe half the people I know have had it by now. And most people will. It's, it's, it's kind of like, Many people are living as if they're trying to live their entire life, and, and perhaps they are, without ever contracting it. Mm -hmm. And I think actually part of why I didn't even bring this up, but you were asking why I was quite calm to begin with. It's also because I assumed I was going to get it. 
right? The amount that I travel, the thousands and thousands of people that I meet, I was like, there is no way on earth I'm not going to get this. I don't know if I'll get it in 2020 or 2021 or 2022 or perhaps multiple times, but I'm going to get it. So the best thing I can do is, you know, take care of my health, make sure I'm in shape, do what I can to make sure that I'm in a reasonable shape so that when I get it, when that positive test comes, I'm like, okay, here we go. Um, I had it in January, you know, I was sick for three days, mild, moderate for three days. And within a week, I was, I was in and out of it. Uh, do I recommend it to people? No, but also I do recommend just acknowledging in your brain that, okay, regardless of, you know, there's people who, you know, they've taken two, three shots, they've worn their mask, they've been wearing gloves, everything still got it. So people who have done none of that stuff haven't got it yet. So you can't really, you can't really hide from it. And I think that comes back interestingly, sort of philosophically to that core point of, of strengthening the individual. Mm -hmm. And this, unfortunately, has been the message that has been totally missing throughout this entire narrative. How many governments, how many authorities, public health experts, et cetera, have given any information to people about, look, there are things that you can do to strengthen your immune system, to strengthen your body so that with not just this disease, but all the other things that kill people from various heart diseases to cancers, to diabetes, et cetera, these are things you can do to increase your uh, chances of survival and not having to go to hospital and not getting very sick, et cetera. Of course, look, age, age is age, right? You can't, um, <laughs> that, that's, that's a, that's a variable that we're, that we're not in control of, but even regardless of age, you know, there's a big difference between being 65 years old and being in great shape versus being 65 years old and being in very bad shape because you have abused your body so much or gotten grossly overweight, et cetera. So I would have, it would have been such a fantastic opportunity especially given that, look, one of the biggest problems that we have in all of the Western world is obesity. Fact. It has been for several decades. It's getting slightly worse and worse every single year. People don't like to talk about it because it's not politically correct. And it's, uh, you know, it makes people uncomfortable and makes them feel like they're being attacked, et cetera. But this would have been the perfect time for them to say, okay, look, in the USA, they, they I mean, statistically, 78% of people in the USA who are hospitalized with this particular virus were overweight or obese, nearly 80%. So instead of doing this fake politically correcting or acting like that, that information should be broadcast everywhere. People should be like, look, this is the wake up call. This is the wake up call. Okay. If you are genuinely concerned about this and other things that can harm you, how about we have some campaign, we have some encouragement, we have some ambassador, something to encourage people to lose weight. Instead, they shut down the gyms, open all the fast food restaurants, uh, so on and so forth. So to me, as someone who's a genuine health advocate and who's really into health and fitness and nutrition and training, it's so frustrating to see that. And then people are acting like everything is as simple as just, oh, just just wear a mask and stay at home and whatever. It's, it's putting all the onus on everybody else. Now, of course, nobody wants to, <laughs> no, 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 if, if, if you are sick, you don't want to go out and spread your spread your germs or viruses to other people. But we, we already know this. We've known this our entire lives. I've never needed yeah. the government to tell me, okay, if you've got, I mean, if I've got a cold, I won't even, I love going to the gym, but if I've got a cold or whatever, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm not going to go to like some big party and start coughing and sneezing all over people. I, I already know that, you know, I'm not trying to spread disease to people, but if you are not sick, then acting like you are, <laughs> is actually insane. That's a sickness in itself. And treating everybody and assuming that everybody is sick when you have no reason to assume or believe that they are is actually really psychopathic. And it's, it's actually a very dangerous notion to have in society where you just simply see another individual human being and you assume that they are some type of existential threat to you. Um, and I think it's really horrible how so many people have been programmed over this course of time to, to believe that. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting seeing the differentiation place to place. And from time to time, I've been to seven different countries during this and the, the differences have been pretty extreme in some cases. Um, and, you know, I do think that we will get through this. I, I remain optimistic. I think there are places that are, that are already through it, but um, I, I think the majority of this is really to do more with the mind than with the body at this point. Yeah, well, it seems to me to be the fear and control. I mean, it's it's the um, 
I mean, we can go down the sinister rabbit holes and it does appear to be getting more and more sinister. And, and um, like, it does appear like that. Yes. Um, in some places, absolutely. Yeah, but I, I am, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back in time because um, I went back just to have a look at the very, your very first few videos on YouTube. And um, I'm going to take us out and we will probably end back up. In, but <laughs> I kind of, um, I know we spoke about this idea of putting yourself out there but I, when I was looking back at their videos, I thought, fucking hell, like, it's, <laughs> he hasn't changed in the sense of his enthusiasm. <laughs> you know, Zuby, the name was right front and center. It's like, you knew this is, this is a good name. Yeah. I'm going to keep this name. And that, mm -hmm. that's kind of entrepreneurial in a way that, and, and that insight of marketing. And, and it was just the, that, putting yourself out there in the world. And mm. like, you know, uh, um, uh, that's a slow process of grafting, but it seemed to be, and I saw something where you're in somebody's kitchen and you did a rap for somebody's, I think it was a best man. Um, when you, uh, I think it was a, a stag oh, wow. party. A yeah, stag party. okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I just thought, I just thought, you know what? I just, I, I just loved that. <laughs> it's just you're just going for it because really in a way it's you're not looking for external approval obviously something grabbed you about yeah. that creative process and i just kind of like to you obviously said one day i'm just gonna go for this i, I could <laughs> wait around or something happened you know um and it didn't leave yeah. it didn't leave either i mean it might have got dampened or frustrated or kind of going okay maybe i need to get a serious job you, you know <laughs> you know what i mean by that um um, so I'm just curious as to that sense of, can you, can you think back as to when you, when you put yourself out there or was it always part of, you know, that fearless trait you mentioned? Mm. No, I, I don't think it was always out there. I think actually when I was a kid, I was relatively shy. Um, I was relatively shy. I was always creative. I used to be into drawing a lot and I used to actually play piano. Um, and I played trombone for a little while as well. But I used to mainly be known for my art in terms of drawing. I used to draw a lot of cartoons, uh, do a little bit of painting and just do a lot of sketching and stuff like that. Um, in terms of the music that really started, I became a hip hop fan when I was in and my what teenage hit you years. There? What hit you in terms of hip hop? Obviously something. I don't know if there was one particular artist that really got me into it. Um, I used to listen to a lot of Tupac, Nas, Jay-Z, Eminem, early Eminem, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube. Those are some of the artists I remember listening to pretty early. Um, and also I have older brothers and they used to, they used to listen to hip hop as well. So I had some awareness of it prior to that with uh, Wu-Tang Clan and Busta Rhymes and th those type of artists. Um, but in terms of me being an artist uh, musically, that started when I was in university. So I was actually traveling. I got stuck in an airport in um, Paris of all places. I think I was flying from the UK, from London to Lagos in Nigeria. And I had a 24 hour layover. I was by myself, I was bored. And I just started writing and recording some vocals into my phone, just acapella vocals. And I picked it up pretty quickly. And then when I got back to university, I would download beats off of the internet. And the first song I made was a track called The Bad Man. So I, I had just uh, made a song and sent it out to friends and family and whatever and got their feedback. And then I made another track called Oh No. Then I made a song called Tonight. And then within 10 months, I had my first album out, um, put together my first album it was a eight track, eight track CD called commercial underground. I started out with just making 50 copies, which I sold primarily to friends and families, uh, friends and family, people around my university. Then I took that money. I reinvested it. I think I made another run of about 200. Then I managed to sell those 200. I went back and I made a thousand and that's wow. when I started, uh, you know, I, I eventually I ran out of people in my inner circle. And that's when I started going out to, uh, you know, if you know, the city of Oxford, I used to just be out on Corn Market Street, often every weekend, oh, really? uh, talking to people out there on the street, playing them, my playing them, my, my music and selling my CDs like that. So it okay, really so started you stood on the street. Yep. Yep. Okay, I did right. that for many, many years. Eventually, I was doing that all over the UK. So that's how I initially really built up my name and my following. Of course, I was doing some live performances as well, but that street hustle, all of those interactions. That's taking the skin in fairness. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so well, yeah, yeah. if you want to develop your confidence and ability to uh, handle rejection or being ignored or whatever, 
than there's no baptism of, of <laughs> baptism by fire than uh, trying to sell something that you have created to complete strangers on the street in different cities. Yeah, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, because you're really at the edge in, in terms of putting yourself out there. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I took, to give you an idea, Frank, I, I would estimate over the course of the years, because after the street hustle from about 2014 to 2018, I primarily did it in shopping centers. I ran a um, pop-up shops around the country with my good friend, my good friend Shaudo, who's also an independent artist. I would estimate that I have spoken and met and spoken to, I, I would honestly say about in the UK, I would put it between 300 and 400,000 people. Oh. Yeah. Jesus. One to one, one to one conversations. So, <laughs> I mean, I've sold over, I sold over 25,000 albums doing that. So you can imagine to sell 25,000 albums, how many people you need to yeah, speak to. It was that's, very, a lot of, that's a lot of no. Yeah. Like, it was a lot of legwork. Yeah. A lot of, yeah. So a lot of people ask me now, uh, because in the past few years, so many people have discovered me online and through social media. And a big question I get is, oh, you know, how do you handle the negativity or how do you deal with it? I'm like, dude, man, yeah. I'm, I'm so, I'm so <laughs> seasoned. Like the, you, you don't know how much of this yeah. I've, I've already dealt with. There's not really anything someone can say that's going to throw me off my game. Yeah. In fairness, somebody's hiding behind a computer saying something that deep. to you. It's, yeah. not the, it's not the same as five drunk lads coming up to you and going whatever. Uh, yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. Okay. Jesus. Right. Yep. Um, and so the love then, like, I'm curious about that, um, that belief in that, obviously you just, there was a, what you were doing, you must have loved. There must have been love in there or what, what do you think it was that, um, you know, that kept you going? It's, it's, it's lovely to look back on it now, let's just say, and consider it in this way and kind of <laughs> laugh about it. But there are days in, in that world of going out and not selling any records. Did you have a safety net or, you know, what, what, what was your safety net or what was your, how did you get through those sorts of times? Sure. Well, I think that's, I think that's two questions. So I, I think in terms of a, of a safety net, you know, like I, I didn't really think of it this way, but of course, you know, I'm, I'm an Oxford university graduate. Um, I've got a great family. I'm not someone who ever is going to be, you know, out on the street, totally destitute, no matter what happens, which is, which is good to know. Um, I don't really, you know, consider that, <laughs> that option or need for a safety net in that regard. But I know that that's, things can never fall. Things can't fall that low. Um, but in terms of the ceiling, in terms of looking up, which is what I really do, um, I think a lot of it stemmed from having a, being so clear on my purpose. I'm so clear on my purpose and my mission in life. And I don't think most people are. And I've been really clear on that since my early twenties. So having that makes decisions a lot easier to make. And it makes it much easier for me to persevere, even when things are difficult, or when things seem temporarily hopeless, or when I'm dealing with a lot of rejection or temporary failure or anything like that, just being super aware and super conscious of what I'm actually trying to do and why I'm doing this enabled me to keep doing it. You know, if I'm up in Glasgow, on a Tuesday afternoon, in the rain, trying to sell my CDs to complete strangers in Scotland, um, I knew why I was up there. Trust me, I had days when I didn't want to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, right? I had great days, I had bad days, but ultimately I knew that the seeds I was planting were, I knew why I was doing it. And I had a, it had an extraordinarily level of confidence that it would be successful. Exactly what that success would look like, I don't know. Yeah. It would have been hard to predict even five years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now in the combination that I'm doing it because so many people now know me for things beyond my music and all these other things. And it's not really how I imagined that people would get to know me. I didn't know that you would get to know me because you saw me speaking out on this. You, you, you see what I mean? So yeah. I didn't know what it would look like, but my goal and my mission is to positively inspire, motivate and impact millions of people around the world through my words and my actions. Mm. I thought initially that that would happen primarily just through my music as a vehicle. 
Um, but additional things have been added. I released my first book two years ago. I've started doing uh, more public speaking gigs. I started my own podcast as, uh, as well as appearing on other people's, all of that. So as long as, plus all the content I put out there on social media. So the through line through all of it, the music, the fitness, the podcasting, the writing, all of it, the through line is positively inspiring, impacting and helping other people. So with that very clear in my sight, it allows me to get through days or get through moments where things seem very, very difficult or very hard or somewhat pointless. Yeah, it's kind of, it's lovely how you describe that because in, and in a kind of a, a strange way, the safety net, you described the Oxford education there and, you know, so that, but the safety net of that, whatever that offering is, for for that creative mind, for that open, that in a way is that's worse to go back into the safe world of mm -hmm. X or Y. So whilst it's kind of tempting and comfortable, and you know why don't you do this or this? Um, it's kind of amazing to have that purpose from so on or that kind of direction clear in your life mm -hmm. that there was no going back. I mean, look, all all things. All things being good, uh, touch wood, you know, inshallah, life is life is pretty long. You know, we we have a we have a while on on, on this earth. So it, it's absurd to me when you get people who are you know, 25 years old or even 35 years old or even 45 years old and they think that they need to give themselves a a, a six month or a 12 month deadline to achieve something that's actually really sort of major or difficult. You know, uh, there's people who think that oh, if I haven't uh, inverted commas made it by 30 or even by 25, or if I haven't hit this milestone or that, then I'm going to just pack it in and I'm going to give up. And I'm like, that is, that's crazy. And why would you do that if you are not so passionate about what it is that you're doing? Like, I don't really start something unless I'm ready to do it for at least 10 years, right? Like I, if not, why would I even bother? Before I started my podcast, I thought, am I willing to do this for 10 years without blowing up or without seeing massive money or whatever from it and the answer was yes if the answer was no i wouldn't have started it because mm -hmm. there's no point starting a podcast and then being like oh well you know i'll give it i'll give it six months and if if i'm not as big as joe rogan in six months i'm gonna mm -hmm. i'm gonna quit right it's like going to the gym and being like you know and I've, I've had people ask me this I've, <laughs> I've had times where i remember i remember specifically i was i was in the gym i think i was in norwich and I was training and there were, you know, a couple of young guys in there, maybe like 17, 18. And, they, you know, they saw me training. I was lifting some impressive weight or whatever. And they were like, oh, you know, like how, uh, what, what, what did he ask? He asked like, he was like, man, like, you know, I don't want to sound, he's like, you've, you've got like a great physique. Like you're really strong. You know, I was like, oh, you know, thank you. Um, he's like, how long have you been training? I was like, at the time I was like, ah, about 15 years or so. And he's like, man, like, I really want, he's like, how can I look at you? I was like, he's like, man, how can I, how can I get to lifting what you're lifting? And I was like, I just told you, man, I've been, I've been at this for 15 years consistently. And he's like, yeah, but like, what's a quicker way? <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I mean, I'm not going to recommend performance enhancing drugs or something, but I'm like, well, this, this mentality, that's the problem, right? It's like, look, if I knew how to achieve what I've done in 15 years in one year, then it wouldn't have taken me 15 years, but there's no substitute for experience. Some things just take time. And it's also funny because in the creative world, especially people have this notion of always wanting to rush things, right? I mean, the notion that if you think of the traditional world of work, the idea that you're going to peak in your career in your twenties is crazy, right? Imagine you go work for some company and you expect to be the CEO or the managing director by the time you're 25 or, or even 30. Like it, it's, it's silly. You look at the top of the company, the people are typically going to be 50, sometimes mm. even 60 plus years old because they've needed those decades of experience. Yeah. But in certain fields, people think, okay, I'm going to just do this. And if I'm not successful by the time I'm 25, <laughs> then, um, you know, I'm a failure or something. And so people need to get out of that, you know, instant gratification. I want everything fast. I want everything now. It's, it's good to, it's good to desire that because it keeps you hungry, but it's also important to be very patient at the same time. If you can maintain hunger and patience, then you'll, you'll do well. I mean, for me, in terms of my career, I mean, I released my first album in 2006 
and things really started to pick up for me in 2019. So that's 13 years in. That's 13 years in. If it got to, if it got to 20, if it got to 2015, or even you know, and I was like, you know what? I've been doing this for almost nine, 10 years. I'm gonna just pack it in. I'm gonna stop. Then you wouldn't know who I am. 99% of people who know who I am now wouldn't. And all those people, all those lives I've been able to impact in some positive way, none of that would have happened. And so you have to really have that level of self-belief to where you want to believe in yourself so much and what you're doing that the average person thinks you're delusional. Mm. But you also need to be really good at what you're doing. And if you, if you, can, if you can do that, then like if I tell people what I'm trying to achieve and they, they don't look at me kind of like with a bit of skepticism, then I'm like, hmm, I'm not thinking big enough. Right. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm, I, I want people to be like, of course, you know, I want to surround myself with people who know I can do it and who encourage me. But uh, I actually quite like it when someone's like, whoa, this guy's thinking, this guy's thinking too big. And it's like, good. I want, I want to be thinking too big to, for the average person. How are you in daily life? I, I, you happy? <laughs> I'm so happy, Frank. Yeah. I'm so happy, man. Even, even when I'm, even when I'm temporarily having a low moment, I'm happy by disposition as a default, even when I'm sad, I'm happy because I am, I'm very fulfilled. I'm very mm -hmm. fulfilled. I have a, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. I do what I love for a living. I have wonderful, I have a wonderful family. I have wonderful friends. I have thousands and thousands of people around the world who truly love and appreciate me and what I do. I can go to any city in this world now and I have friends there. Um, and I've got, I mean, when I was traveling in the USA, and even just coming from, from Mexico, I mean, in every single city, every single city, I mean, I could call up a mini army at 24 hours notice and just have, I mean, some of the meetups I did, I ended up having like a hundred plus people. And that's yeah. off of me just saying, Hey, I'm in the city who wants to hang out. And that is beautiful. Um, I, I can't have that and not, and not be, not be happy because that's see, that's me seeing my dream and my vision coming to life and seeing it genuinely impacting and helping other people. And as someone who's very much wired for whatever reason to want to do that, it, um, not, nothing makes me feel better than that. So even when things are difficult, I'm still very, very happy. Okay. Yeah. So I thought it was lovely. I actually noticed I was watching the, the way you'd have meetups and wherever it was. And it's kind of an interesting let's say non aloof thing to do is obviously an appetite to, <laughs> to be around people. So I'd be curious, did you just score high in that high in extroversion? You know, that uh, or extra extroversion, uh, extroversion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, obviously you get energized by that too, by being around people. Um, yeah. But there's obviously at the moment as well, there's a bit of a kind of, uh, you're bringing other people together too, especially around this freedom mindset, let's just say mm. of, around COVID, the people who you're bringing people who wouldn't have known each other together yes. because of that. And I think that because there is a kind of an aloneness, people feel mm -hmm. alone in their families with, with this, if they're not going down this vaccinated route or they have a view on it, there is, um, so that's the kind of a lovely thing to do. Mm. Did, you, did you feel that was kind of part of it too? Oh, certainly. Certainly. Um, I mean, see what, I, what I advocate for to me is not, it sh or it should not be overtly political. I mean, yes, I have my political views, but what, what's been happening is because of the very deliberate politicization of this issue and many others, and because of intentional rhetoric and actions and policies that are put out there I believe with the intention to cause division amongst people. And you really, really see this amplified in the USA. It's present everywhere, but it's really amplified in the USA. Everything's left versus right, red versus blue, black versus white, vax versus unvax now, right? They're always people in the media and in power. It's an, it's an old trick, divide and conquer. They're always trying to find that wedge between people that they can use to get them bickering and fighting and to prey off of that natural human desire for a sense of, of a sense of tribe, right? It's tribalism. So when I do these meetups or whatever I'm doing, I'm generally trying to be like, look, number one is why I'm so big on the concept of, of liberty and freedom, right? It's like, look, you should just be free to 
if you are a, a decent law abiding, peaceful citizen, you should be able to live your life freely without massive coercion or being attacked or being shamed or being excluded or segregated. Pretty, pretty basic stuff. I mean, to me, that I thought that was liberalism 101, right? Just yeah, live and you know, let live. Yeah, just live and let live. It's not new. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right. Don't judge people based on their immutable characteristics. Don't attack someone or try to defame them or whatever because they're black or because they're white or because they're brown or because they're straight or they're gay or now you know they're vaxxed or they're unvaxxed or what. It's just like very basic things. Look, treat people decently, treat people honestly. And also, when you we have there's eight billion people in the world, nearly. And no two people in this world agree on absolutely everything. But if we're going to have a, a disagreement or a discussion or a conversation, let's be civil. Let's not let's not attack and demonize each other and threaten each other. And what we, you know, like things have some some things they they escalate so much. And it's just like, look, I, let's can, let's just talk. Whether we we agree, we disagree. Let's talk. Let's be decent. And that's really what I encourage. So when I do these meetups. And that's one of the beautiful things about them. You know, you can do a meetup. Wow. Okay, cool. There's 80 people here. You know, everyone is, I'm like, wow, this is true diversity. You know, everyone, you know, from the surface level to the deeper yeah. level, everyone's different. Not manufactured diversity, no, it's, actual no, it's, diversity. Yeah, exactly. Right. And what, what people have in common there isn't that everyone, you know, votes exactly the same way, or they have the exact same beliefs on everything. No, they, they don't. And I know this for a fact, um, but everyone is willing to treat each other as human beings and to be honest and to have conversations and be empathetic and try to understand each other. And that is really what is, I think, missing and has been for several years from much of the public discourse. It's always labeling and name calling and attacking and attacking and straw manning. And it, it's trying to just make it seem like everything is just a complete binary, right? It's mm -hmm. just a binary. Either you are here. If you're not pro this thing, you must be anti this thing right? If you are not totally here, you're totally there. And that, that's not just, that's simply not true. Human beings are very nuanced. And, uh, you know, we're, 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 it's not as simple as just just a coin toss on every single individual. And everyone's just, you know, purely good or purely bad or whatever it is. So it's just trying to remind people of this, I believe that much of what I say in a, in a sane, in a saner time, would really be just common sense. I'm, I'm not saying i mean something they perhaps some things i say are profound but i think a lot of what i say is like look just come on guys like what what are we what's <laughs> what, what's going on here what's going on with this constant demonization or this attacking or if we want to talk about the time we're living in right now i mean we in in modern so-called liberal western democracies i never thought and this is coming from you know someone who uh, family backgrounds originally from Nigeria and who, who was raised in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia. Never did I think I would see modern Western liberal democracies reinstituting segregationist policies, reinstituting and having people um, advocating for outright discrimination, aggregate, uh, you know, advocating for medical coercion, you know, trying to force people to do this or force people to do that or threatening people's jobs and livelihoods because they don't want to take a certain medicine. I mean, if you if you told someone that even in 2018, they would have looked at you and been like, "No, nah, that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. That sounds like something they do in China or North Korea or Soviet Russia or something." And so, for me, that's been the part that's been disheartening is the way that people have been led down this path once again. Once again, to where, yeah. To, yeah, to to where they're advocating for that. I mean segregation has been done in history before it's been done on different levels and different ways and one thing we've concluded is that okay that's not the way forward that's not good right mm -hmm. saying that okay this group of citizens has this rights and this group does not have this rights or these ones must do this it, it's not it's not good it ends in division it ends in violence it ends in hostility every single time we know that so i look at the situation and i'm just like really guys you know come on is this is this the way we want them. Can't, can't we just look at the situation? Is, is this say, loop in the same loop again? Like, I'm yes. kind of curious, like, and we mentioned Jordan Peterson. I mentioned Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson would, some of his lectures, I remember looking at bits and pieces of them a few years, and they, they were, they're almost bang on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would describe this scenario of, um, and, and I, I did a podcast with somebody, you know, it's like, how far can you be pushed? But mm. it's, it's this general movement of, um, I, I'm going to say to you, uh, Zuby, do you mind just moving out of my way here? I need to move my chair. 
and you're going to turn around to me and go, ah, oh, well, I, you know, I'm here. I, I, I don't want to move. And I go, look, I, I know you don't want to move, but just move anyway. Just move. And you go, okay, I just move an inch. Mm-hmm. And then I come back an hour later and go, look, thanks for moving, but can you just move a little bit further away? And that's uh, that's that description is it's kind of like you know it's push a little bit of pushback, but if you've already with the first push got in. And I, I'm curious that even the likes of Jordan Peterson, who would have studied this so well, it doesn't see it. He's seeing it now, maybe in the mm-hmm. last few months, but he, there's a voice. And, you know, it's, it's OK to stand off and pontificate, but it's, it's, I've, I feel it's too far gone now. We're in the thick of it. We're talking about an Austria where they're going to, you know, mandate it. And Germany is talking the same way. And Australia looks like something from a movie. It looks mm-hmm. so tyrannical. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm curious, you know, as some people are were lost in their daily lives, not seeing it. You know, it's not head in the sand. It's just kind of like, and and when pe- where people's too far is, mm-hmm. I don't know. I know what my too far is. Yes, just my too far is back off straight away. Back off. Get mm-hmm. out of my house. You know, stay away from me. I leave you alone. You leave me alone. That's exactly. mine. Mm-hmm. But an awful lot of people have just gone about their days. I don't think it's. It's neither good nor bad. It's just they've gone about their days, and then suddenly, it's here. And yes. it's where we are, it's it's the moment, and yeah. maybe people are starting to sprout and going, okay, I'm not going to do the booster. Mm-hmm. That's my too far. But I'm just curious, and I'm curious about in Ireland how far can they denigrate people who don't take it? You, yeah. you know, I'm saying a lot there, you, but you get the general. Point. I get you it's absolutely. Like we're, we're in the thick of it now. Mm-hmm. This is the alive time, mm-hmm. and it's not going away. Yeah, well, I think, man, there's so many ways to go on this. I think for to begin with is it is quite unbelievable. Mm. Right? So I almost don't, I can have some level of sympathy and empathy for people who kind of don't believe how far it's gone, because they didn't think it could happen. Right? It, It almost seems like it's not real when you hear about what what they're doing in Austria or you know in, in Germany or can, Australia. It almost doesn't seem real. It's like, wait, am I in some? Am I being punked here? Right? It, it, yeah. what, what's going on? Right? And then also because see, th- the smartest tyrannies and the smartest modes of authoritarianism come under the guise of some greater good or some public safety, security, or a health measure, right? If you're just doing something that's bad and the excuse for it is just that we just want to be bad and we just want to be evil and tyrannical, then people cotton on to that very quickly and push back against it very hard. If you can convince people that the authoritarianism and the tyranny is for their benefit, especially health, you have to remember you know, how afraid of death human beings are, in general, and also if that the people feel that the authoritarianism and the tyranny is being perhaps targeted at people that they don't like or they disagree with, then they are way more likely to fall in line with this. And you also have to remember that most people don't look at history in the way that we do. I mean, you've you've brought up Jordan Peterson a few times, so you know I've been listening to his stuff for many years. And, you know, I have read the Gulag Archipelago. I have read Ordinary. I read these things before any pandemic situation. So I'm very hyper-conscious and have spent a lot of time prior to all of this thinking, okay, if I existed during this moment, what would I have been like? And if something like this ever happens again, and it will because human nature has not changed, how will I respond? Am I going to be the one who is a perpetrator? Am I going to be the one who is silently just watching as long as it doesn't directly affect or hurt me? Or am I going to be someone who pushes back against it? So I've spent a lot of time thinking. So as soon as I caught on to, hmm, okay, these are things that we should be talking about, or these are my concerns, I started speaking out immediately. It really wasn't popular at the time at all. I mean, you know, being called a, a, a grandma killer or people calling yeah, me selfish, that. Su- yeah, suggest- yeah. suggesting that I, you know, I, I want this virus to just run, run roughshod through everyone or whatever, you know, that was never ever, never my position, right? My position was always a selfless one. It was always like, look, you're going to, you're look at how many people's lives you're destroying and to consider what the downstream repercussions of this. Number one, I mean, wh- what's crazy about a lot of this as well is that it's not even, <laughs> it's not even proven. There's no strong evidence that the lockdowns or mask mandates 
made a good made a made a positive difference well, there, there's there's there's, you, there's no so so it's not even that there's a hundred papers though have you seen the research from myver cummins he has it on his website yeah. but there he has at least uh 50 papers showing the negative impact 50 oh, yeah. peer-reviewed mm -hmm. papers it's also and important it's also important to remember that the uh, the World Health Organization itself never recommended this in the event of a pandemic. Yeah. They, they advised against lockdowns. Mm. They advised against these mandates. So even if you want to go the, you know, trust the experts, listen to the experts, it's like, well, the, the World Health Organization itself prior to 2020 said that this is not the way that we should respond in the event of a pandemic. But all that just got thrown out the window. And it was done anyway. And now, again, you've got mountains of data from all these different states, cities, and countries. And you can look at it. You can look at places that did lockdown and places that didn't, places that has very strict mandates and places that didn't. You will not see any strong correlation between that and hospitalization or death rates. And we've known this for more than a year. But instead of changing course, it just gets repeated, it gets repeated, it gets repeated. And this is what also makes people become more, shall we say, conspiratorial. Because they're playing hide the ball with ball with, 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 you know, something the size of, of an elephant, right? There are very basic things that they refuse to even talk about, not natural immunity. How is this not discussed, right? If the goal is to actually, you know, keep people safe and healthy and to, how, how are you going to just totally ignore the fact that hundreds of millions of people have had it and recovered and got antibodies naturally? Um, and you're still just running with this simple, you know, vax versus unvaxed. If we were serious people, You'd be talking about, um, you know, immune versus, you know, various degrees of immunity. That's what you'd be talking about, whether it's vaccine induced or it's from, um, or it's from natural immunity, which which they've known is several times stronger. Which again is not new because we've known this for a very long time. So there are some really obvious things that are being ignored, and this is what makes people look at the situation and go, hmm, there's something else going on here. There's something else going on. This doesn't make sense, right? There's so many things here during the course. And it's not making sense and people need to make sense. So one way you can make sense is by acting like the whole thing is um, a lot more scary and deadly than it needs to be. And that, you know, certain precautions are way more effective than they actually are. That leads to one type of reality or the other is to accept that, okay, this is not, this is not simply about health and safety and security. And there's something else going on that leads to another reality. And again, I think that's why you're seeing this bifurcation almost across the almost across the human race in different countries and different different places where people are living in these alternate realities. And it's very strange. When I was in the USA, I traveled to ten different states, and the different the differences in in people's behavior between the states and even between certain areas of the states was was like nothing I've ever seen before. Yeah, it's, it seems to be down to what people are consuming because people really, they don't have their own views. It's really the views that they're fed for the vast majority. It seems like that that is the case, that if it's not, that there is a ministry of truth and if mm -hmm. it's not being told to me by the mainstream media, then it's not the case. Yes. And that seems to be how it is. But like, I, I always kind of think that the truth has a simplicity to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of, it's it's um, it's not hidden. It doesn't need a huge amount of words. It doesn't need a lot. It's just kind of obvious. And you know, the biggest truth out there is well, what is your risk? And if there was if there was love out there at all, love would say, well, look, if you're eighty and you're even if you're healthy and you're eighty, you're probably going to be fine. Yes. But if you're unhealthy and aged eighty, you're, you you need to be very careful. Yes. And I think that would be the case. COVID or no COVID. There's exactly. a simplicity about that. Mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. In terms of lockdowns, whether they work or not, well, is there science? The science suggests that they don't work. That's mm -hmm. kind of simple, but that and, science and is also, ignored. And also, yeah. let's look at the, look, everything is trade-offs as well, right? Yeah. So if you're going to, one thing that was most frustrating about the lockdowns particularly was no, no one in, let's say, a position of power or authority or supposed expertise truly considering the downstream repercussions mm. right of course people are now complaining about inflation it's like you did really you didn't you didn't see that you didn't think that if you pumped trillions of dollars or pounds into the economy and kept everyone at home not you know many had millions of people unemployed for over a year that you're you're going to get inflation of, of course you are the impact that it's having on children mental health increased depression increased suicide rate these are all things i was talking about 
last year, people missing uh, cancer diagnoses, people missing treatments of other diseases. Um, the impact on people's physical health, obesity levels have gone up, not down, right? Um, and so these were very obvious, predictable, foreseeable things, but no one wanted to talk about it. It was this very myopic tunnel vision. We're just going to focus on this one thing, everything else, everything else be damned, consequences be damned. Uh, who cares if your business goes out of business? Who cares if you become unemployed? Who cares if we shut down our high streets and people lose their homes and there's all these supply chain issues, all of that doesn't matter. Um, and so it would be one thing to, I, I've, I've made the analogy before that it's like, it's like seeing a, a rat or a cockroach in one room in your house and you just decide to, you know, de detonate, or, you know, demolish the house because of a rat rather than trying to use something a little more precise, a little more focused to yeah. deal with the situation instead of just blowing, blowing the whole thing up and causing all of this totally unnecessary collateral damage. And that was the essence of what you said there is the essence of the Great Barrington Declaration. Absolutely. Just protect the vulnerable. Exactly. I mean, uh, uh, it's obvious. Yeah. It's obvious. It's you, should, you shouldn't need to be a, a scientist or a doctor to know this, right? It's, and this is another thing that's been strange through this. So it's a couple things is the silencing of, of these doctors, you know, so, you know, you're, you're Martin Kaldorf's and, uh, you know, Pierre Corey and Jay, what's, is it, how do, how do I say it? Yeah, so yeah. You, you've had very, you've had doctors out there throughout this whole thing, famous, non-famous, who have been speaking out, who have different opinions, whether it's on treatments or it's on the policies, so on and so forth. And they get ignored, right? They're acting like the only doctor in the whole United States is, is Fauci, right? Yeah. Forget what all, you know, forget what, all, forget what all the other doctors are saying. Um, and let's not look at, you know, how corrupt this guy is or whatever. And it's just, it's just that he himself, I, mean, I don't know if you saw when he said that criticizing him is an attack on science. I don't know if you saw it when he said, I mean, yeah, yeah. What, what, what kind of megalomania is that? Um, I mean, that's just crazy. And also the thing is, look, if you want to talk about science is science is based on inquiry, right? Mm -hmm. I'm always skeptical of any so-called expert who gets mad when you ask questions, right? We should always be able to ask questions. We should be able to put everything on the table. We should be able to challenge things. We should be able to talk with degrees of nuance and in areas of gray, not just black and white about everything, the pros and cons to everything, the real numbers, the upsides, the downside. If you're talking about deaths, are we talking about deaths with, or are we talking about deaths from, right? What is the average age? That matters. If something is going out and you know the average age of people dying is 40, that's very different between something happening and the average age of death is 80. Is that me saying that, 80 year old lives don't matter. Of course, it's not me saying that. The point is that our entire lives, you know, everybody dies, right? Our, our, we have an expiration date and you can't keep somebody alive forever. And unfortunately, as we get older, you become, <laughs> for, for lack of a better term, you become, you become easier to kill, right? Whether it's from a virus or, or anything else, that's just the reality that we've always been living in. It's the story for all of human life, all animal life. And I recognize why people don't like to talk about these things sort of honestly and frankly, because it can feel a little bit weird or uncomfortable, but it's just, it's just a reality. And I think that we've been denying and trying to reject reality for so long that when reality comes along and sort of slaps the entire population across the face, they get really emotional and don't know, and don't know how to act and want to point the blame at other people and start calling people names and all of that. But I think if everyone could just be more honest and more open, then we could have far more constructive conversations throughout this whole thing. And we wouldn't be at this level where people are demonizing each other and trying to pin the blame on each other and all of that. And it's all, I think people want to be right. Mm. So whether it's the big, whether it's the politicians and the media they, and whoever's looking after, you know, the, in the healthcare, or, they want to be right. So then to admit that they were wrong in any way, shape or form. That's a sort of a kind of an inner death. Mm. So some people will protect that and they may protect it to severe, severe implications for anybody, you know, if they can get, if they're found out, that, yes. that is the possibility. Mm -hmm. But I, I was, um, I was, I have been struck by people's uh, total lack of capacity to consider other um, say for, we take ivermectin right mm -hmm. and say ivermectin is there isn't all the data to prove it categorically right mm -hmm. but it seems to be any discussion that I've entered into with people has been everything to disprove it as opposed to curiosity 
yes. of maybe it could work. But mm-hmm. let's just try it because we yes. are in a very risky scenario. We're mm-hmm. in if we're in this really deadly scenario, mm-hmm. let's try it. Let's mm-hmm. try it everywhere we can. Yes. It's zero risk, high potential reward. Let's try there it. There you go. But 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 all you and like if you like forget everything, right? You hear somebody like Dr. Pierre Corey give his testimony in front of the Senate. And you hear the way he talks and you look at his qualifications, you, you can just feel that authenticity, really. Yes. You know, you, re- you really can. But even if even if you you can't and you just say, OK, well, he's he is biased. Well, you kind of go, well, how is he biased? Or, mm-hmm. and it's just the total lack of that. And then you see somebody like um, Dr. McCullough, mm-hmm. who's putting everything on the line really his life on the line there's no gain he just wants to save lives exactly and it's it's totally i i find that the kind of hardest to go well okay maybe let's prove it wrong then i mean i i knew it wasn't i, I wasn't waiting on joe rogan i knew about this as you probably did. i knew about i ever met him a year ago mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. how did how does somebody like me know about it yes. when doctors Everywhere in Ireland, are not talking about it. In the UK. Yes. they should be talking about. It. You know what I mean? Uh, look, I don't how, want to know about it. Uh, why? Why can't we talk about Africa? Yeah, got got a whole continent of fifty four countries that's, that's largely breezed through this thing. I think across the continent, the vax rate is around five or six percent. I think the entire continent, according to official stats, has less deaths than just the UK. One point three, one point four billion versus sixty six million. Now, of course, we we can question the data, and we should. But, I mean, it's been it's been two years. If there were a super deadly pandemic, and there were a particular continent that you think would get really hit hard, obviously it would be Africa. So, how can there be this huge area of the world, and no one's asking questions? I have I have some things that you know I, I think and I believe about it, but I don't claim to have all of the answers. Something I do a lot is. I just ask questions, right? I'm, I'm trying to understand the truth. I don't have an agenda. Like with this whole thing, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the benefit to me? What's, what's the profit in there? I'm like, look, I'm just trying to work out what is going, what is the truth, right? You're, you're, we, we know, we, it's established that the media is not giving us the truth, right? They're not giving us the truth. They're not giving the whole, us the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. See, so right? They're, they're playing hide the ball. They're ignoring certain things. They're overblowing certain things, right? So, you know, the ivermectin thing. I mean, the notion that you can't properly talk about it freely, even on YouTube, is unreal. Mm. It's unreal, right? I don't know the exact efficiency or effectiveness of it, or if it works for everybody, or right, I've, I've listened to podcasts on it. I've spoken to actually some doctors in real life about it and so on. Um, I don't know. But like you said, the notion that people don't even want to know, and this is where you have to assume ulterior motive, right? And there's a very obvious ulterior motive here, right? Which is profit driven, right? And so this is what makes people start thinking that way, right? And so it's hard to have these conversations with certain people as well, because it's like, well, if you're operating in the realm that there's not even any possibility of ulterior motives, and everything is above board, and all these experts and scientists and people in media are being honest despite the despite their lies despite the goalpost shifts etc um you know if you've got someone who truly believes it's all about health versus someone who believes that mm, you know there's something else going on here then again it's it's a it's another it's another split it's another schism that is quite hard to is quite hard to get through um, and you know, one person can, you know, one person will think the other is a sheep and one person will think the other is a crazy conspiracy theorist. And we would, again, we wouldn't have any of this if people were simply able to properly exercise their freedom of speech. This goes from everyone in the public to people in the media, to people on social media platforms, to other, to doctors, to scientists. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of doctors and scientists in this world, Right. And they all have will have different ideas, different positions, different theories. And it's like, cool, can we can we listen to all of them? And if someone gets disproved, okay, that's that's fine, right? We can have some humility. Let's not just cling on to the ego so hard, right? We have a pandemic of people not wanting to say that they were wrong about anything. And it, it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have assertions and then find, oh, okay, someone pushes back and or has some new data or facts. And you say, okay, no, okay, that we assumed this, we we thought this would be the case. And okay, it's not. Um, here, let me, let me, let me give a great example of that. Even though from a civil liberties perspective, I am very much against the concept of, you know, these full-scale lockdowns, I would have thought 
that there would be a poor, cause, positive correlation between them and reduced deaths and hospitalizations. I would, have, wow. I would have assumed that would be the case, even though I'm against them. It's a policy. And then I looked at it. I was like, whoa, I'm not seeing any clear correlation. I was looking at all the 50 states in the USA and then looking you know, between uh, parts of Europe. Like we got places like Sweden, Albania, Belarus. I was like, hmm, this is not the, 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 the trend. There's, there's no clear trend here. And that, and that was a surprise to me, right? Even now, as is happening, I mean, there are places, look, let's be real. There are places now which have... I mean, you're, you're in Ireland, right? Mm. So in your county of Waterford, isn't that the most highly vaxxed place in the entire, yeah. uh, in, in the whole country, over 99%, and it has the highest infection rate? Yeah. That is not what I or I think anyone else would have expected, right? And it's like, you're not meant to talk about that, right? You're not meant to talk about Singapore, Israel, Gibraltar, right? These places have extraordinarily high vax rates, and they're having very, very high infection rates. So what is going on there? But it's like, you're not supposed to talk about that. You're supposed to just like hide and keep on repeating safe and effective, safe and effective and safe and effective and not ask or inquire, right? When it comes to adverse reactions in situations like that, again, you're not meant to, you know, it's all these things are supposed to be taboo and people get angry when you even bring them up. And it's like, look guys, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything, but if we can't talk about this and, and point out things that are obviously weird like i was like okay wait that is weird then how are we ever going to really get to the truth and how are we ever going to have a situation where you know we can just have people live harmoniously again have all their freedoms have their liberty actually keep people as healthy as possible you know reasonably and so on i do think that these things can be done you know we've managed it <laughs> prior to 2020 we always managed it things were not perfect but we but we managed it and, um, you know, I, I think that we can get there, but I think that we get there through honesty. Yeah. And remaining curious, if at all, if that's at all possible. But then maybe it comes down to this idea of openness and, mm. um, and just that capacity. I think for the most part, people are just living lives. Like I've heard people say, oh, you know, people have head in the sands or whatever. It's, they're just, there's a kind of a trust there mm. of, and I, in a way, I think it's a reflection of, Let's just say for the most part, people are good and they'll follow the pack, they'll follow the leader. And if the leader tells them it's something, then that's the way it is. And they just go with that. Yeah. I mean, you know, corrupt governments, corrupt religions, they've all survived for so long because of that unquestioning. And it's mm -hmm. a kind of a naivety, a trusting, it must be the case, as opposed to going, yeah, it's not adding up there. Yeah. And, and I think that really then depends on the character. And the character really then can, um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I think people look. If you are in any position of authority, you increase trust by allowing questioning, mm -hmm. right? If I tell you that I'm an expert in some subject and you ask me about it, and I insult you or try to silence you or even censor you because you asked me a question, then what does that say about how I feel about my expertise? What does that say about my character, about my personality? This is one of the biggest problems we're having with all these institutions, with, with the government, with the media, um, with some of these companies, with big tech, et cetera, is because it's, again, it's, it's all, it all stems from a lack of honesty. It stems from a lack of honesty. And if people were willing to say, I don't know, or I was wrong, or this is what we believe for now, but this can change, or okay, you know, you're right on this, whatever, then things would just all together be so much better. Because if you cannot ask questions, like I, I automatically don't trust any authority that doesn't, that doesn't want me to ask questions, right? Uh -huh. and, if the, and if you have a rule or a law, there should always be a reason for it. If the reason for the rule is because that's the rule, it's a crap rule, and I don't mm -hmm. respect it. Right. There should always be a reason for a law. If you look, if you think, I mean, if you just think of like our, our, the typical laws that exist in a country in the UK and Ireland, et cetera, there is a reason for them, right? There's, there's a clear, logical, explainable reason why that law exists. But if you have a law or a rule, you know, if someone said that, um, you know, on Tuesdays, on Tuesdays, you can't wear yellow, right? And you said, why? And their answer was like, that's the rule. That's the why. The parent goes, no, that's the why. What do you mean that? I'm just asking you why. Yeah. That's the why. That's not a reason. It's not an answer. No, no, it's, 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 not, it's, not, a, it's not an answer. You know, if I want to enter a restaurant, 
um, and I, I want to sit at a table that I can see six, six feet away from me. And they want me to put a mask on to take the three steps to the table. And I ask them why, which I've done many times. Um, and they say, that's, that's just the rule. Then what is going on here? Right? Like what, what is, is, it doesn't make any sense. It's not scientific. It's not rational. It's not logical. It's not helpful. It's just, it's just silly. You know, I call it all security theater, right? It's just, it's just theater. It's a theater of the absurd. And for me to do something like it has to make sense to me. Like it, it's not like, it's not like asking for a lot, but it's absurd because also you, you're seeing these same nonsensical ideas and policies being put into law in some cases, not just in one country or in one city, but across the entire world. How is it you have the same stupid rule? You had it in the UK, you have it in Mexico, you have it in Portugal, you have it in Turkey, you have it in the USA. Like how, or how, how are you all doing the same nonsensical nonsensical rule. Say if this was the private sector. In mm. Ireland, the entire government, the entire health system would just be fired and, and it'd be, okay, we've tried it your way. Well done, lad, but you have not achieved anything in this past 18 months. You need to, your, your desk has been cleared. But you just, you know, go to front reception and get out of the building because they've done such a terrible job. But these people are the mo the least innovative and they're, they're, they keep their jobs for life, you yep. know? So fuck yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, uh, yeah. It's just, and again, this is this is the thing. This is what makes makes people think that there are ulterior motives, you know, because it just doesn't make sense. You know, again, you look at the Australias and the New Zealands, places where they don't even have cases. You know, like people aren't even the situation ain't even serious out there, um, and they keep ramping up and escalating and escalating and, you know, taking more and more of people's rights and trampling on more and more liberties. And I mean, you see some of their politicians talking and I'm like, yo, you cannot tell me that this person has good intentions. Like this person is not speaking in a manner that suggests in any way, shape or form that this is about, you know, health or compassion or empathy or just basic human decency, because that is not how somebody talks when they care about you. Uh, honesty has a way of speaking. It's like, uh, did you hear the guy, um, the general, the general, the Surgeon General of Florida? Um, he was given the job maybe three months ago and works with DeSantis. And he, just the manner and how he speaks. If you haven't seen him, it's really worth. It's it's just so ma matter of fact, so honest, mm -hmm. so kind of. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about the vaccines that they, they have side effects we need to look into that yes this, this and everything is just kind of you know there's other approaches there's other ways we're not going to put masks on kids mm -hmm. there's no sign we don't have the data yep there's no proof that that works mm -hmm. uh, and you know what i mean it's just that kind of language mm -hmm. um comes across very strongly but uh, i'm conscious of your time so what have you projects in mind have you projects coming up what is what is um gonna take hold of you through this dark winter that you now face <laughs> um well hopefully it won't be a dark winter but um of course my album word of zuby is out now okay that came out in august that's available on all platforms itunes apple music spotify can get the cd and upcoming vinyl from teamzuby.com as well um i continue to pu push my book strong advice that's continuing to do well I've got several music videos which are going to be on the horizon for my latest album. I've actually got four in the chamber right now. So I've got more of those to come. Of course, I got my podcast, Real Talk with Zuby. And there will be more projects in the future. There's always okay. going to be more stuff, more music, more podcasts, more live events, and so on. Um, and yeah, people can stay up to date on that. You can follow me on social media at Zuby Music. That's Z-U-B-Y Music. Thank you so much, dude. Um, I, I should thank my friend Jeff for um, sending OK Dude my way. Um, so I'm just going to thank you. I'm just going to press report and stop on the recording. Hi, if you like the conversation that I just had and you'd like more, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.
um, 